One of my favorite phrases in all of my life, we say it here every week, is open your Bibles, but this evening we're going to look at a multitude of verses. We don't have a single passage that we're going to exegete as we normally do, so I would just encourage you to write down all the addresses because there's going to be a bunch of them. Now, it was interesting. I ran across someone, a Bible disparager, critic on social media, who put up a, a little post that said, you know, my favorite part of the Bible is when God created man with free will and then killed them all with a flood because they didn't do things his way. Now, this person obviously has a very tainted view of God, but the fact is sometimes the judgment of God is a difficult issue for us to deal with and even reconcile when he's presented himself as being love itself, not just a loving God, but God is love. Amen? But our loving God also has a judicial side of him, and he uh, practices what we would call retributive justice. He never gives anyone something that they don't deserve, even in the form of punishment. Now, our subject tonight concerns a time period that bears multiple labels. It's called the tribulation. Some refer to it as the great tribulation, and indeed it is. It's referred to as the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it's also referred to, as we'll find tonight, the title of our session, which is the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, some of these titles refer to the whole seven-year period of the 70th week of Daniel. Others are more specific to the last half of the Great Tribulation or the final 42 months or 1,260 days. And whatever phrase is being used and whatever portion of the Tribulation is being referred to, we recognize we're talking about a future event. The tribulation hasn't happened. And when it does, we're not going to be here. Amen? Now, what we need to recognize is what the tribulation is all about. Why would there be such a radical time that I believe that can be divided into two halves? Obviously, the Bible divides it as such, but even two halves of God's wrath. If we look at the first half of the tribulation, we could well examine that as the consequential wrath of God. In other words, the universal law of sowing and reaping is being reaped upon the whole earth. There's great famine, people are killing each other, and it's human-to-human events that take place during uh, the first portion of the tribulation, and then things shift in the second half, at the end of the Antichrist reign, to the cataclysmic wrath of God, where he begins to fight as he fights in the day of battle, reminding us of how he dealt with Pharaoh in Egypt when Pharaoh wouldn't let his people go. Now, this time period that bears all these titles and monikers, if you will, is going to accomplish two aspects of God's plan. Now, the first thing that the tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel is going to accomplish is it will complete the Lord's discipline on the nation of Israel. It will bring about the fullness of God's wrath, as you see later in the chapters of Revelation, specifically 16, 17, and 18. And we're reminded in Daniel 9, 24, that 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, who would Daniel's people be? The Jews, obviously. What's the holy city of the Jews? It's Jerusalem. Now, here's what's going to happen. Here's the point of the time period we're going to look at tonight. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, this is the angel Gabriel communicating to Daniel that there are six purposes of the 70th week that is prophesied. The 69 have been fulfilled, and now we are in a time period, the church age between 69 and 70. And what's going to be accomplished during the 70 weeks, and particularly the last week, transgression will be finished, putting an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up both vision and prophecy, and to anoint a most holy place. Now, if we look at what the Lord told Daniel, the first three things deal with the sins of Israel and God bringing their sinful rebellion to an end, reconciling them finally through the atoning blood of Jesus. 
The final three things address the fulfillment of all God's prophetic promises to the nation of Israel. Now, that's one of the reasons that replacement theology is such a heresy. God hasn't done all that he said he was going to do with the nation of Israel. And therefore, if he has cast off Israel forever, portions of his word are unfulfilled and never will be fulfilled, throwing suspicion over the whole of God's word. Now, bringing in everlasting righteousness when Christ returns, sealing up vision and prophecies means to fulfill all the things that were written prophetically that haven't been fulfilled concerning the Jews and the world, and also to anoint a most holy place. Now, there's some debate as to what that holy place is. Some see it as the temple of the uh, millennial reign of Christ on earth, and others see it being a reference to the new Jerusalem, the ultimate place without a temple. So I would have to lean towards the the prior uh, in that there is no temple in heaven for the Lamb is its temple. And the fact is we know there's going to be a temple, a fourth temple during the millennial reign of Christ on earth. And by the way, I'd never really thought about it like this, and Amir Sarfati and I were chatting about this, and then I heard him teach on it a couple of times. How often, I I think when everybody goes to Israel, they go to the Temple Institute and see the high priestly garments, all the trumpets and the bowls and everything made for temple worship. And yet, and a lot of Christians throw their money at all the things that are necessary for the building of the third temple, forgetting that the third temple is not a temple that's sanctioned in the Bible. Now, it's alluded to or assumed in Daniel that the uh, Antichrist is going to go in and defile this most holy place, but it isn't a holy place at all. It's the Antichrist temple. It's not the temple of God. That's going to happen uh, in the millennium. Now, some would argue that there's actually going to be a cleansing of that temple, but uh, I don't think so. I think there's going to be a new temple worthy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he rules from Jerusalem. Amen. Now, the second thing that's going to be brought about is he is going to complete, after he completes his discipline of Israel or simultaneously, the tribulation is also meant to judge those who dwell on the earth. Now, that's how they're referred to. The Christ rejectors during the tribulation are referred to as earth dwellers. Now, in Revelation 15, 1 to 4, John said, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, For in them the wrath of God is what? It's complete. It's full. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your what? Judgments have been manifested. Now, during the great tribulation, the wrath of God is going to be complete. It's going to be brought to its fullness. And it will be a time of God's manifested judgments on the earth. Yet, during this time, there are going to be those who have victory over the beast. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Now, Daniel 9.24, which we read a few moments ago, we found that 70 weeks were determined. Now, we need to understand exactly what that word means. Remembering, they are determined for Daniel's people, the Jews, and Daniel's holy city, Jerusalem. Now, the primary meaning of the word determined is to cut off. And that means that there is a cutoff point when the 70 weeks expire. It can also mean to be settled or even to mark out. Now, that doesn't mean 69 weeks are going to be fulfilled concerning Daniel's people and holy city, and then the church is going to replace Israel. Nor does it mean that 69 weeks are going to be fulfilled literally, and the 70th becomes allegory. The 70th week of Daniel is a literal seven-year time period that we call the Great Tribulation. Now, it is a time that is marked out, And there's a cutoff point at the end of those 70 weeks when Jesus returns to the earth and rules the nations with a rod of iron. Now, when we hear about a week, the 70 weeks in Daniel, we have to remember that when the Jews heard the Hebrew word Shabuan, 
That simply meant a period of seven. It could mean seven years, seven days. It was simply uh, translated as, into English, as seven. So 77s are determined for your people and city. Now in Leviticus 25, 1 to 5, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I will give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the, what year? Seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. Six years of harvesting, one year of letting the land rest. That is a week of years, or a seven-year period. Now, this was a sabbatical cycle that the Jews violated for 490 years that led to their captivity in Babylon for 70 years, as written in Jeremiah 29.10. And it was during the Babylonian captivity that Daniel received his four visions, including that which is determined for Daniel's people in holy city. So as one who was under the judgment of God for violating the sabbatical cycle or the sabbatical year, those who were reading what Daniel had written or hearing what Daniel had been shown would quickly move to the fact that it wasn't talking about a week as we know it, but it was talking about a seven-year cycle. Now, as we sit here tonight, 69 of those seven-year periods have been fulfilled. And 70 minus 69 is, oh man, you guys are scaring me, is one. How many weeks are left? There's just one week to be fulfilled. Now, here is part of what happens to identify and kick off the 70th week. In Daniel 9, 27, we're told, Then he, I'll tell you more about him in a moment, shall confirm a covenant with many for how long? It says one seven in the Hebrew. But in the middle of the seven, he shall bring it into sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate until the consummate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now the he of Daniel 9.27 is the beast of Revelation chapter 13. And he establishes a seven-year covenant with Daniel's people and holy city. At the halfway point, he breaks the covenant. He brings an end to the reestablished sacrifices and offerings in the rebuilt temple. And he commits what Jesus himself referred to as the abomination of desolation. In other words, he goes into the place reserved exclusively for the high priest once a year and declares himself to be God. Now, I'm sure most of us have at least heard of the famed four horsemen of the apocalypse that ride out into the world seen symbolically in Revelation chapter 6. John says when the first seal was opened in Revelation 6 2 that he looked and beheld a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and he had a crown given to him or he was given a position as a ruler and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, because of the color of the, the, uh, the rider's mount, a lot of people think this is Jesus because the good guy always rides a white horse and wears a white hat. Well, this is not possible for a multitude of reasons, namely because the rider on the second horse takes peace from the earth. And listen, when Jesus brings peace, nobody's taking that peace back. So it can't be Jesus. Amen? Now... In the Septuagint, the word bow here, the word rainbow in Genesis 9, 13 to 16, are the same word. And the bow hung in the sky was symbolic of a covenant that God had made with the earth to never destroy it with flood waters again, which establishes for us that a bow is symbolic of a covenant. So the first writer rides out into the world scene with a covenant agreement that is a, a seven-year agreement with the holy people and the city, or the people of Daniel and the holy city. Now, it's interesting that we're told when he rides out, he has a bow. It makes no mention of any munitions or arrows, so to speak. It's just a bow. And therefore, we might say that the Antichrist 
conquers a world through diplomacy. In other words, he brings about a pseudo peace that the world is willing to have anything or accept anything in order to obtain. Now, we're told also he goes out conquering and to conquer. Now, that word, both words, conquering and conquer, mean to subdue. So he's going to subdue the whole of the earth and mesmerize the whole earth, and the whole earth is going to go after him, and the whole earth is going to worship him, save the a portion of the Jews and believing Gentiles. Now that means that the tribulation begins with a covenant made with Daniel's people and holy city for the duration of one week or seven years. Now we might ask the question, I mean, come on, everybody knows about the Antichrist. I mean, Hollywood makes movies like The Omen and Rosemary's Baby, and I don't know what they've currently made, but Hollywood is obviously aware of some of the biblical uh, things that are contained in there concerning the devil and the end of days, and they make movies called Armageddon and talk about uh, catastrophic events at the end of time and all these other things. So how does the world arrive in such a state where this character who's known for millennia, truly, through the scriptures, how is he not recognized right away by Jew and Gentile alike? And how does he deceive the whole world? Well, Second Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 gives us part of the answer, where Paul says, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling into that day is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. That's the rapture. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. There's a chronology here. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? God. That's the abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke of. Now, remember, the Lord gave us a promise in John 14 when he was dealing with his disciples, struggling with the fact that he was going to die and the Holy Spirit was going to come when he told them that he was going to prepare a place for them. And when he went to prepare a place, he did so because he was going to do what? Come what? Come again in order to receive them unto himself. Now, the falling away spoken of here in Second Thessalonians 2 is the Greek word, some say apostasia, the word is actually, uh, or, or some say apostasia, I can't even say it, I said apostasia, it's actually apostasia, and it's defined as a defection from truth. Now, another form of the word means to divorce. It can also be translated as repudiation. So let me ask you today, has the church largely defected from truth? Around the world, it's obvious. The evidence is all over the place. Is the word of God today being repudiated? Now, remember, repudiated means to refuse to accept. Are people refusing to accept God's word today as written? Absolutely. We have all kinds of things happening in the church. Are many churches divorcing themselves from the moral statutes recorded in the word of God? And again, the answer is yet. Yeah. Therefore, the world is ready to be deceived by the writer on the white horse. Now, when the beast sits in the most holy place, showing himself that he is God, again, the abomination of desolation, Jesus said to the Jews in Jerusalem specifically, run, pray that your flight is not in winter and that you're not pregnant, obviously to the ladies, for what happens next is a series of unprecedented events in the course of history as far, to, far as cataclysmic events on the earth. Now those days are called, at the, after the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation. They're also referred to as the great and terrible day of the Lord. The last 1260 days or 42 months are also called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 37 is where we find that phrase where the prophet says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, there's a myriad of things I could talk to you tonight about the tribulation, and particularly the great tribulation, a time that Jeremiah says there's no other time like it, a time that Jesus said, if I didn't come back and bring it to an end, no human would have survived the great tribulation. 
Now, we could talk about the fact that during the tribulation, the rider of the sickly green or pale horse is given the power to kill a fourth of the inhabitants of the earth with the sword with hunger and with the beast of the earth. Animals are going to be attacking and eating humans for food. There'll be such a famine, a global famine during that time. People will be killing each other in order to steal food from one another. We can mention that under the sixth trumpet, another third of the earth's population is killed. We can discuss that there seems to be an asteroid strike, a great mountain burning with fire, thrown into the sea. A third of the sea is going to become blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea will die. A third of the ships are going to be destroyed. And after that comes a comet strike, poisoning a third of the world's fresh water supply. And according to Revelation 8, many men died from the water because it was made bitter or radioactive, uh, wormwood. Uh, also implying radioactive in the name of the comet. Now, we could spend our time reading Revelation 16, which is the fullness of God's wrath, completing his wrath on the earth. A loathsome sore comes upon all who took the mark of the beast. The seas then are turned into blood like that of a dead man. And then the rivers and streams of the earth are going to follow suit and become blood as well. I can tell you about the sun being superheated or at least bombarding the earth with uh, Uh, negatively charged ions, a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare, as some would describe it. And it destroys the Earth's protective magnetosphere with a class 5 geomagnetic storm, I believe, and bombards the Earth with these radioactive ions, causing radiation burns on people's backs and scorches men's bodies all around the world. I can mention that this is followed by a darkness so dark people gnaw their tongues in pain following the drying up of by rather the drying up of the Euphrates River, the Battle of Armageddon, and the greatest earthquake in the history of mankind. We could talk about all those things tonight, but I'm not even going to bring them up. Now, what we are going to do is point out that like the 69 weeks, the 70th week fulfills purposes and plans of God. I want to highlight three things specifically for you tonight. And by the way, That was our introduction. So would you pray with me, please, and we'll get into the message. Father, we do thank you for giving us such information. And Lord, may our motivation again be uh, understanding the gravity of the events we see and the horrific things that are coming upon the earth. Lord, may it just burn in us a desire to tell people about Jesus, that they might be saved. Lord, give us clarity on this and ears to hear what your spirit is saying tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, three things I want to point out. And you can put the at the top of your page, if you're a note taker, just put our title, The Time of Jacob's Trouble. Three things that happen during the time of Jacob's trouble. Three things that are the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble. And the first is this. Listen, the time of Jacob's trouble proves to the Jews that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. The time of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, proves to the Jews that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Now, listen, I wanted to make sure that we identified the Jesus we're talking about, because I don't know if you know this, but Barabbas, meaning son of the father, his name was Yeshua too. There were a lot of people named Yeshua at the time of Jesus, so we want to make sure we're talking about the right Jesus. Amen? There's people today that have a character in their religious system named Jesus, but it's not the same Jesus. The Esau of Islam is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of Mormonism is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of Mormonism is the spirit brother of Lucifer. And listen, Lucifer is not Jesus' brother. Somebody say amen. He is a created being that Jesus created. He is not Jesus' brother or equal. Now, there's a lot of talk in Israel today about this being the age of the Messiah. President Trump has caused a lot of talk in the midst of the rabbis because, one, we moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to the actual capital of Israel, the eternal capital of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. And then behind that, not too many months later, we recognized Israeli sovereignty over the the Golan Heights, which the Bible has assigned to the Jews many, many years ago. And because of this, there are rabbis who are saying either the Messianic age is near or the Messianic age has come. 
I was talking with a gentleman some years ago, a wonderful man. Uh, he was a general in the uh, uh, Six-Day War. He was run over by a tank, a man named Gershon Solomon. He's got a ministry called the Temple Mount Faithful Movement. Some years ago, may, you may have read in the news that there was a man trying to set the cornerstone of the next temple, and 17 people were killed. That was Gershon Solomon. And we had a wonderful opportunity to chat with him. And he was always quick to say, and he said it multi multi multiple times in our conversation and then again with the rest of the group. He said, we're both waiting for the Messiah. We're just waiting for him to come the first time. You're waiting for him to come back. Well, the Messiah is coming. And he is coming back, and there'll be some interesting things that happen with the Jews when he does. And this tribulation will bring it about. Now, a couple of insights here from Revelation 13. You guys still here? Yes. 13, 1 to 5 says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. Now, pause there on as if, because it, he wasn't actually dead. It's just as if he was dead. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed who? The beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. So... Who went after him? All the world. So all the world at this point becomes Satan worshippers, who is a dragon. And they worship the beast, saying, who's like the beast? Who's able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for how long? 42 months, half of the tribulation period. Now, this is the one who makes the covenant with Israel for one week or seven year period. Now, remembering this is the 70th week of Daniel, and therefore it pertains to Daniel's people and holy city. So we have to look at what happens here through the perspective of the Jews. Now, in Jewish literature, including the Bible, the sea often refers to the Mediterranean. When it just mentions the sea, it's referencing, referencing the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the coast upon which Israel sets. Now, figuratively, the sea, the phrase the sea is used regarding non-Jewish nations. Now, the land from which the second beast arises from is figuratively used in Scripture and elsewhere for Israel. Now, this gives us maybe a hint that the Antichrist is actually a Gentile. The beast is a Gentile, and the false prophet is a Jew. Now, somebody asked me a question on Sunday about this uh, teaching that's been floating around about the Antichrist actually being a Muslim. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you think that the Jews are going to make a covenant with a Muslim Antichrist? I don't think the Jews are looking for a Muslim to come as their Messiah. And that's who they're going to think the Antichrist is, their Messiah. So just throw that out. And don't waste your time digging around with that. It's not, the Antichrist is not a Muslim. Somebody say, now. Either way, the first beast is a covenant maker and breaker with Israel. The duration of his authority is 42 months or half the tribulation. Now, in Zechariah 12, 8 to 10, we're told, In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is, who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David or a giant killer. And the house of David shall be like God meaning the whole of the kingdom will fight the way the Lord fights, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Now, if we note that that phrase in that day is always associated with the tribulation period uh, in prophetic writings. Zechariah 12 to 14 uses that phrase 16 times throughout those three chapters. During the time of Jacob's trouble, when the Lord fights against those who fight against Jerusalem, he's also going to pour out at the end of that battle the spirit of grace and supplication on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What this is going to result in is 
the remnant of surviving Jews looking to Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah, mourning the actions of their ancestors and their rejection of him, mourning for him as one would mourn for the loss of an only child. Now in Romans eleven twenty five to 27, we're told Paul writing, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now the time of the Gentiles began at the Babylonian captivity and will end at the rapture of the church. And there are those today who teach what's called dual covenant theology. And if you ever hear anybody use that phrase, run, turn off your ears, turn the channel, close the book, throw it away. Because dual covenant theology is basically that the Jews can be saved through one means and Christians or Gentiles are saved through another. Some believe and teach that the Jews are saved just because of their ethnicity. They're saved by their first, first birth. But what did Jesus say to the teacher of Israel? A man named Nicodemus, what did he say? He said, Are you, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know this? You must be what? Born again. He's talking to a Jew. So do the Jews need to be born again? Absolutely. And you can only be born again through the Messiah of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, our Savior. Now, the problem also with this teaching is that we have to remember all the early disciples and church fathers were Jews. And they were all born again, and they were all, were all referred to as Christians, not Jews. Now, Zechariah 13, 8, 9 also says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring one-third through the fire, meaning the tribulation and the uh, trials and testings on the earth and the Antichrist seeking to kill them. Will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them and I will say, this is my people and each one will say what? The Lord is my God. Two thirds of the Jews are going to die during the tribulation and they will die in unbelief. One third of the Jews are going to look upon him whom they pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And throughout the duration of the tribulation period, they will be supernaturally protected by God, just like at the Exodus when the Lord said to Pharaoh, from this point on, the plagues, the seven plagues I'm going to pour out are not going to come near my people. So you will know that I am the Lord. Now, Romans 10, 8 to 13 also says, what, it is, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's the last stop on the Romans road. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For, say it with me please, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what did they say at the end of Zechariah? They will all say, the Lord is my God. Now, Paul quotes from Joel 2.32, and then he makes an association of that passage with the Lord Jesus. Now, there's only one way to be saved, and that's through the blood of Christ poured out for our sins on the cross, and the name that is above all others, at which every knee someday will bow and make the confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Now, what will finally open the eyes of a third of the Jews to the fact that Jesus indeed was their Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, the next purpose of and for the tribulation is this. Listen, the time of Jacob's trouble produces the largest great awakening in human history. The time of Jacob's trouble produces the largest great awakening in human history. Now, we need to dissect this a bit because there's a difference in revival and a great awakening. In Ezra 9, 7, and 8, again, after the Babylonian captivity, we're told, since the days of our fathers to this day, we've been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation, as it is to this day. 
And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of what? Revival in our bondage. By the way, if you ever want to read some radical prayers, read Ezra 9, Daniel 9, and Nehemiah 9, all these men praying about the condition of Jerusalem, and we should pray the same way over the condition of the church. Now, the word translated revival means to preserve life. It can also be translated to recover self. The word also means to renew the validity. And for something to return to life or be preserved, it implies previous life. Now think about what we're seeing here in Ezra. The chosen people of God, according to Ezra's prayer, had been very guilty. They had been delivered into the kings of the lands to the sword, captivity, plunder, and humiliation is what he confesses before the Lord. And then he prays, Lord, renew the validity of your people as the chosen people of God. Now, revival in the church is the same. Revival within the church is to return to the valid status of the work of the church, which is proclaiming Christ instead of much of the nonsense we see today. Now, a great awakening, in contrast, is when spiritually dead people are made alive. And it's distinct from God's people getting back to their calling and commitment to the Lord. That's revival. Now, in Ephesians 2, 1 to 5, we're reminded, And you he made alive who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of what? Wrath, just as the others. But God, boy, I'm thankful for those two words, aren't you? who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when, there's another pair of wonderful words, we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Dead people being made alive in great numbers is a great awakening. And this is what happens during the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, let me remind you, there will be no church to revive during the tribulation because the church is going to be out of here. The Jews will not need to be revived during the tribulation because they were never alive spiritually in the first place. They were apart from Christ and as spiritually dead as any Gentile. Now, think about what we mentioned a moment ago. Zechariah tells us a third of the Jews are going to be saved. Now, based on the numbers we know today, that means that during the tribulation, over 5 million Jews are going to come to faith in Christ. Now, this is astounding because according to the Jews for Jesus website, there are about 250,000 Messianic Jews, Jews who believe in Yeshua or Jesus the Messiah in the U.S. 20,000 Messianic Jews are now in Israel. When Get this, when Israel became a nation on May 14, 1948, there were nine Messianic Jews in the country. Now there's over 20,000. That's progress, but it's not very speedy. Now there are as many as 350,000 Messianic Jews worldwide at this point in time. So what's going to bring the number up from 350,000 globally to over 5 million? The answer, the time of Jacob's trouble. Trials and tribulations associated uh, and sufferings associated with it that Ezra described have long been an effective tool for turning some people to God. Now, we also need to think about this. There are many unsaved people attending church. Attending church doesn't mean you're a Christian, right? It means you're a church attendee. But Christians should go to church, right? Right? Yes. Hebrews 10.25 says, go and go a lot when you see the day approaching. Now, among the many unbelievers that attend church today are the anti-Semites and the progressives or liberal Christians who have rejected the word of God as written and its moral code. Now, I believe that when the church is raptured prior to the tribulation and Israel takes center stage on the world scene, a man rises to power who deceives the whole world and conquers it with a covenant, that there are some people who are going to say, you know, this is all st starting to sound really familiar. And I think they're going to realize that they have missed the rapture, even though much of the world tries to describe or, or assign it away as a 
cosmic cleansing, and that's what the New Agers teach about this coming event that's going to happen in the world. Now, in Revelation 7, 9 to 14, we're told, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. White robes, uh, Revelation 19 says, is the righteous acts of the saints. Palm branches are symbolic of victory. Crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Somebody say, Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? So I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of what? The great tribulation, again, a phrase assigned specifically to the 70th week of Daniel. And they washed their robes and made them white out in the blood of the Lamb, the same way that we do. Now, this group comes out of the great tribulation after the abomination of desolation, telling us a numberless multitude of Gentiles and likely over 5 million Jews are going to come to faith during the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, let me just add this. I had this question come up just the other day. There are people who say that if you heard the gospel before the rapture, you can't get saved during the tribulation. Now, listen, if that was true, it'd have to be true now. Is that true now? Well, no, it's not even biblically accurate or sound because the Bible says one plants, another waters, and another reaps. So there's a progression oftentimes in people coming to faith. Not everybody gets saved the first time you hear the gospel. And if it's true during the tribulation, if you heard it and didn't, give your life to Christ before the rapture, then that would have had to be uh, something that was already established in Scripture because the Lord doesn't change. Amen? Yes, you can get saved during the tribulation period, but I highly recommend missing the whole thing. Amen? Now, God is saving people now who heard and did not immediately repent, and he would do so during the tribulation. Now, otherwise, why would he do this? Revelation 14, 6 and 7 tells us that during the time of Jacob's trouble, John saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to who? Those who dwell on the earth. Is it up there? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now, what we're told basically is that this angel is flying at the high point of the sky. The word can be translated as meridian. That's where the sun is at high noon. As high as the sun is ever in the daytime sky is where this angel is. And he's preaching to the whole world. Now, would God send an angel to preach to the whole world if people weren't going to get saved? Well, it doesn't make any sense. Now, interesting that his message is a lot like that of Jonah. Jonah had a mini sermon that caused the whole nation to be saved. When Jonah in 3 4 entered the city on the first day's walk, he cried out and said, Yet 40 days men of us shall be overthrown. That was his whole sermon. Jonah 3 4. And what happened next in verse 5 says, So the people of Nineveh did what? They believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Now, during the time of Jacob's trouble, an angel flies through the midheaven, and his message is, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now, what's the end result of this? A numberless multitude from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people are believe, are believe in the Lord. They're saved during the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, this reminds us that the way Jonah preached and the way this angel preaches tells us we shouldn't be afraid of bringing up the judgment of God when we are preaching to those who are lost and dying in this world. Now, the fact is, preaching judgment is going to spark the largest great awakening in the history of humankind and when judgment comes and it's near and even at the door, we need not shy away from the judicial nature of God. Our God is a righteous judge. Amen? You know, one last thing and we'll wrap it up. We've got a few minutes left here. Also, the time of Jacob's trouble brings the moral digression of man to its inevitable end. 
The time of Jacob's trouble brings the moral digression of man to its inevitable end. Now, the inevitable end I am talking about also has an inevitable end. So let me tell you about the inevitable end of the inevitable end that I'm referring to before we move on. I don't know how many times you can get inevitable in one sentence, but we got four or five in there. Revelation 21.8 says, The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and what? Oh, nobody wants to say it, huh? All, is it not up there? All what? All liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, this is obviously speaking of those who practice those things unrepentantly. Now, the second death is the inevitable end of man's moral digression, but there is a point of no return that is reached prior to Revelation 21.8. And we also find it in the time of Jacob's trouble. And what we just read in Revelation 21.8 happens after the millennium at the great white throne judgment. But prior to that, we're told in Revelation 6.15 and 17 that the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and in, of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Then in 9, 18 to 21, Revelation says, By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their powers in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not what? Repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Listen, the stage is being set for people to enter into the tribulation with such a mentality. People are going to know that God is pouring out his wrath on the earth, but they're going to call out to the earth to hide them from the wrath of him who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Are people worshiping the earth today? Oh, absolutely. The world is first. The earth is first. And we humans, we're just uh, unwelcome invaders on it to hear some people talk today. Now listen, let me give you a few things that are currently happening. 40 schools in England recently banned wearing skirts, and all female students must wear pants. Do you know why? They don't want to offend the transvestite students. So girls can't wear skirts to school anymore. In Canada, the Supreme Court banned Christian schools and colleges from teaching biblical value, values because biblical values do not align with the Trudeau government's position on, uh, or government's vision on diversity, and therefore... People who have a biblical perspective or worldview are harmful to LGBT and Muslim students. California, there's legislation pending that would make it illegal to operate a business or sell literature that seeks to reverse gender dysphoria to match one's natural biological sex. In other words, you can't tell somebody, you may think you're a female, but you're actually a male or vice versa. You're not allowed to give them counsel in that area to teach them that they are genetically and biologically uh, that particular gender. There's a growing movement around the world today to normalize pedophilia. Everybody was crying out with the big battle over marriage that this was just a slippery slope and the next phase would be normalizing other aberrant sexual behaviors. And there's a strong movement today that the LGBT community is trying to distance themselves from where people are saying, listen, a pedophile just has a different sexual preference just like the LGBT community. And this is happening in the world, and there are people who are buying into it. There was a journalist who writes for a magazine called Science Journalist who wants the world to know that human sacrifice is a good thing as long as it's done by people of a brown skin color and claim that it's part of their cultural heritage. Now, we could go on and on and on and on, even as the Guttmacher Institute reports that globally there are 42 million abortions per year. That's an average of 155,000 a day globally. But the fact is, Romans 128 reminds us, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, is that's happening today? People don't want to hear about God. 
They don't want to know about its judicial nature. They want to feel like they can do everything that they so desire to do and fulfill every lust. Now, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a what? A debased mind. To do those things which are not fitting. Is that happening today? Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, or whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteousness of God, just like during the tribulation that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, I don't believe there's any more evil invention in the history of mankind than killing innocent children inside their mother's womb and people approving of it. Are people approving of it today? They're fighting for it. There are very few who would get more violent and more vehemently oppose any of us who had the audacity to stand up and say that abortion is wrong. This tells us that mankind collectively has reached the inevitable end of its moral digression. And listen, the only way to stop this moral slide is the judgment of God. And during the tribulation, people will know God is judging them, yet they'll be so morally corrupt they won't repent. That's the first inevitable end the lake of fire is their eternal home, is the second inevitable end. Now, the time of Jacob's trouble is going to open the eyes of many Jews that Jesus is their Messiah. Yes, there'll be the largest great awakening of spiritually dead people in all of human history. And yes, there will be a myriad of people the book of Revelation calls the earth dwellers who have no interest in repenting, but would rather cry to rocks and mountains to hide them than to turn to the true and living God. Now, these are three of the things within the purposes of God for the time of Jacob's trouble. And again, my suggestion to anyone is that you just miss the whole thing and be supernaturally transported into the presence of God in a moment and twinkling of an eye when he snatches us away by force and takes us forever to be with him. He has promised that he is going to do that. He's going away and he's coming again. He's preparing a place for us that where he is, we may be also. And because we do not, as we talked about on Sunday in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, we do not have an appointment with wrath and the tribulation is God's wrath. We have to be removed for the integrity of scripture to be maintained. Jesus is coming soon. The rapture is imminent and even at the door and the tribulation will follow. And I don't know, I've never heard anybody who said anything concrete about the, does the rapture signal the beginning of the tribulation? I tend to think it doesn't because there's going to be a world restructuring and this man has to have time to rise to power. So we don't know when that's actually going to begin after the rapture of the church. But what we do know is that the world is in the condition that the Bible says it will be in when the tribulation begins. And again, I'll remind you of what I've said many times. The great escape precedes the great tribulation. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Pray with me, please. Father, again, we're thankful that you have given us the hard stuff to read as well, the difficult things for us to examine. And Lord, even as our finite thinking tries to reconcile you being unwilling that any should perish, yet pouring out your wrath on a world in the way that your scripture says you're going to do. But Lord, help us also to come away tonight, knowing that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. You never err, you never make mistakes, you never do anything that is wrong or unjust. So Lord, help us to face these things that we might have trouble with and struggle with and wonder about and just recognize that you have offered to all mankind the opportunity to be saved. And Lord, as it's been well said, you don't send anyone to help people choose to go there. But Lord, we thank you that you are unwilling that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So we thank you that whosoever will may come to this very day. We pray that you use us to lead people to you as the last ticks on the clock seem to be at hand. Give us a passion for lost souls, we pray in Jesus' name. 
And all God's people agreed by saying, Amen. It's an amazing thing to consider. These huge masses of people dying within a short span of time. But this is what the Bible is foretold. And the, the thing I think that's so important for us is to realize the Bible's track record is 100%. Everything that it said was going to come to pass has come to pass. Therefore, everything that it says will come to pass is going to come to pass as well. So that's why Jesus said in the heart of the Olivet Discourse, therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour that he is not expected. We are at such an hour. Scoffers are saying, where's the promise of his coming? It's amazing how the church can fight with itself about the timing of the rapture. And it's an easy debate to settle. The whole seven years is the wrath of God, and we don't have that appointment. So the mid-pre-wrath, post-trib positions are invalidated simply by the fact that 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, before God pours out his wrath, we're out of here. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. 